What's going on everybody? My name is Jerry Walker Jr. Thank you guys so much for watching. We are now in Beethoven's 2nd Symphony, 4th movement. This is the final movement of his big 2nd Symphony, you guys. This is big. This is exciting. We're going to be on one H-E double hockey stick of a ride, guys. I promise you, this is going to be big. For those of you that's new to this channel, I am analyzing Beethoven's 9 symphonies. And if you want to see more content of classical music being analyzed on this channel, feel free to like, to comment, and especially subscribe to this channel. I hope you enjoy it. I know I will. We'll get right into it, guys. Now, I remember the first time when I heard this movement, I thought, gosh, this has got to be some presto movement. But shockingly, Beethoven writes... Allegro molto. So a really fast allegro, but it's not prestissimo. To any violinist or definitely to any musician, this is no allegro. I mean, Mozart's Symphony 35, fourth movement presto, is probably about the same speed as this, if you ask me. But that being besides the point, we'll jump right into the analysis. So this fourth movement is in, well, I'm sure you guys guessed it, Sonata and Allegro. Born. So I don't have to recap everything I just say. I'm going to wait. You know what? You know what? Give me a sec. Okay, guys, I'm back. So what I've decided to do was I've decided to still tell you about Sonata and Allegro form, but I decided to take this handy dandy remote here and fast forward myself. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and fast forward myself. So Sonata and Allegro form comes in three big parts. The first part is the exposition section, where the composer introduces three themes: theme one, theme two, and theme three that closes the exposition out completely. Then we get to this development section. This is the second big thing. Uh, this is the second big section of the development section. We then get to the second part, which is the development section. So the composer can do anything they want to do and develop off of any material that they introduce in the exposition. We then get the recapitulation, the third big section. The recapitulation is basically a copy and paste of the exposition. Only difference is instead of you staying in the home key, well, instead of, the only difference is instead of you going to the five of that key, uh, four thing two, instead you get to the recapitulation. You stay in the home key throughout the entire time. You also might get an additional slow introduction or an additional coda at the very end. Okay, that's enough. There we go. Okay, so now we got that done and out the way. So opening up with this very movement, if you look in the very beginning, we just get this very strange and definitely ear catching, but this really strange gesture. It's like, what? 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 What did you say? What? It's like just someone just coming up to you yelling a whole bunch of words that you have no idea what they're talking about, and then you're just like, what? What's also so shocking about this is the interval structure behind this as well. If you take a look, it starts off, it goes to a high G and then goes down an octave and a half all the way down to C sharp. Specifically, an octave and a tritone. Yeah, just, who does this type of stuff other than Beethoven? Who would do this type of thing? I mean, yeah, sure, Mozart kind of did something similar with his 40th symphony. Take a small, quick look at that in the very fourth movement, right when he gets to the development section. Just watch this passage for a minute. I mean, that passage alone is just crazy. But this isn't an analyzing of Mozart's symphony. But I will eventually get to Mozart's 40th symphony. But as of right now, we're sticking with Beethoven's symphonies. And then after this series, I got to do his quartets and then his piano sonatas. And then I got to do a full detail analysis of the symphonies. Again, getting off topic. So in the beginning, we get theme one and we're in the key of D major. This then takes us to measure 12, which then finally we get the transition. Already? A transition already? Really? We're still not in theme one? Well, because this section of 12 does end in A major when we get there, I wouldn't call it theme one. So here we are at measure 12, already in a transition. This transition lasts for quite a while, and then we finally get to measure 52, which then we're officially in the key of A major, and we do get theme two. This theme is kind of passed along between the clarinets and the oboes, and the bassoon kind of comes out to play as well. We then get to measure 68, which then we have the transition that's going to eventually take us to the closing theme. What? The transition at measure 68? Isn't that still theme two? Well... Yes and no. It's material, especially from Theme 2. You still have the background material that the strings are doing, and you still have Theme 2 like concepts. But we're not staying in the key of A major at all. We're actually modulating and we're going to different places and different avenues. Therefore, I'm going to officially say that 68 is where he actually starts thinking more of a transitional like mentality 
more than just staying with theme two. This then takes us to measure 84, which then we get to the closing theme. We then get to 94, which is this really big splurge, this really big uh, fortissimo area, and then we just condense it all down to piano, and it's just bassoon and these little bitty motific uh, building blocks of the first violin and the second violin. He then takes the bassoon away by measure 104 and then gives us just the motific idea, which is just driving you forward, 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 until we finally get right back to theme one. Or is it theme one just yet? So that we get to the pickup of 108 and then this sounds like theme one. It sounds like we're going to repeat everything again, just like Sonata and Allegro form is supposed to do. But we don't do that. Instead, Beethoven decides to play a trick on your ears. Ha 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 ha, he gets you. We then come to realize that at 116, when he flips the key signature to the parallel minor, D minor, oh, we're in the development section. We're not in the exposition. So with Beethoven getting rid of this repeat sign again, just like he did in the second movement, uh, basically it's safe to say that by the pickup of 108, we're in the development section. Our ears doesn't tell us that yet, but he, we're there, trust me. Now, of course, we know that this is Beethoven's favorite section, and we also know that this is one of my favorite sections, too, because I love talking about all the modulations. But, to keep things short, I will put a detailed analysis of, the, of all the chords and everything for this down in the description, at least for all the modulational stuff in the development section. But, I will go ahead and point out that by measure 157, he's definitely modulated his way to the key at F-sharp minor. Then measure 181, I just love this small little part. He gives you the first motific idea in the first violins, and this just this really quiet pianissimo section, and then just out of nowhere just blasts his theme one right back in your face. Which, by the way, this is the recap. So we're at the recapitulation by measure 185, in the key of D major. So now we do all this stuff again, and this is where I just kind of speed things through. So we make it to the transition by measure 196. This then takes us to measure 236, where we're at theme 2, still in the key of D major. We get to the transition by measure 252, and then back to the closing theme at measure 268. Then we get really small and really quiet again, and we think he's just about to end it somehow, in some way, with just a few bars, but he doesn't do it. Instead, of course, we get an additional cut. This being the pickup of measure 294. Now, I have got to pinpoint this out. Do you guys know how long this coda is? I mean, this coda is just crazy long. Literally, the coda alone is 148 measures long. How? We're just trying to end this thing. And Beethoven's like, oh, I'm not done yet. This is going to be over when I say it's over. This then left quite a few of his audience members just kind of stargazed. This because of the idea that, well, I guess to one person, as he so quotes, that this was some sort of a never-ending dragon. Which, honestly, even analyzing this, it's like... Wow, this really is not going to end. But Beethoven's having a good time, so he makes his coda really, really long before he really officially ends this. Uh, so I guess I might pinpoint a few moments in the coda, I guess. So in looking at the coda, he plays around with theme one material for a little bit. Then he plays around with the transitional material that came after theme one from the very beginning of this movement. This then leads us to 334, where we're at these for my Just this really big stop. We get to the fermati where the first fermata is an A major minor seventh chord in first inversion. So it's just like, are we finally gonna end here? Is this it? Is this the end? We get a big D major chord, we're gonna be happy. No. We get to the second fermata, and it's this F sharp major chord in first inversion. How did we go from the five seven of D major to all of a sudden a major three chord in first inversion? What is going on? It's also really quiet, so it's just like, yeah, I'm tricking your mind. This is what Beethoven is thinking. We then get to this pianissimo section and we're getting the key of B minor. To which, of course, now it kind of makes sense for the F sharp major chord to be there because that's five of B minor. Still, I don't know why we're here, but here we are. At measure of 345, he then tricks your ear thinking we're going to end in D again. 
and then he just repeats back what he did in B minor. So we're still going, we're still wondering where the ending is here, and then we get to 358. 358, we're in the key of G major, and we're just like, what is going on? It's all quiet and suspenseful. What's about to happen? This then takes us to a really, really big surprise. We get to 372, and we get this jarring chord that's like, what happened? Well, if we were to analyze this in a normal way, we would say that this is a 5-7 of E-flat. E-flat? What? No, no, no. That can't be right. No, this isn't right. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, not 5-7 E-flat. Well, just like similar, when we were in the fourth movement of the first symphony, he gave us this really big jarring chord that then took us to C minor, to which this was, as I mentioned in that symphony, a German six chord. In this symphony, this is the same thing. It's not the exact same German six chord, but this is a German six chord. This German six chord takes us to one, officially back to the key, a D major. We get all this running scale stuff that's bringing us a whirlwind just all over the place and bringing us to D major officially and we stay in D major. We then get to 386, which is this really gnarly section, especially for us string players. It's just a really crazy section. I love it so much. I just love looking at the position. We then start to get a little bit quieter again, and then he plays around with the theme one material or motific ideas again, and then we get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we finally reach another fermata section. Only this time, this fermata is only F sharp, only the note F sharp. We were in the key of D, and then he strips away the chord, only leaving F sharp, but he makes it big. So it's just like, oh my God, when can we end this? What is happening? When are we going to end? Then we get quiet again, and he makes you think we're gonna do that small little B minor section again. Only we don't. We then elevate this passage by the interval by a half step, which then brings us this mentality of G major. But then you also very sneakily hear this 5-7 of D major. So you barely hear it, but you hear it though. You can hear it one day. This then leads us to the big pickup of 424, where we get this really big massive moment that then just takes us to the end of this. And instead of uh, measures rest at the end, you get a half rest with the fermata over. So the symphony ended, but it's still not over until the rest is officially until you, until the room is officially cleared out of the sound. So there you go. Woo! Finally, we ended this symphony. Oh my God! We finally ended this movement. That's some crazy stuff, guys. So oh my gosh, wow. But of course, for this video, even though we finished the theory analysis, now we have to do the performance. So you'll see the self-performance of Beethoven conducting, Mozart reacting. Mozart's going to get a H-E double hockey stick of other reaction to this. And you'll get to see some of his musicians playing. I hope that you enjoy it. I'll see you after this video.
Guys, man, that is one heck of a symphony, man. But thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys for being a part of this, for joining me on this whole big journey of analyzing Beethoven's Second Symphony. I cannot wait because even bigger, we're getting into Beethoven's Third Symphony, his Aurora Symphony. Oh my God, and that symphony, oh, that's gonna be a long symphony. And because of that, but that's okay because I know you guys like these videos and so I hope you like them. Which, by the way, don't forget to like and to comment and subscribe to this channel for more content and more analyzing of Beethoven symphonies and more analyzing of classical music in general. I will see you guys next time. It will take me a little while for me to get Symphony 3 done, 
but I will get it done for you guys. I hope you've enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.